everybody. Yeah. Welcome back to Bledsoe Said So. We have a wonderful day in the annals of history. Yeah. Stand up. Get out of your chair. Everybody. Standing ovation. We have Alex on camera. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Guys. Oh, my God. Guys. It happened. It's real. 2023. We're coming out swinging. Alex is in the editing cosmos right now. Dude, how you feeling? I'm floating in space, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I'm vibing. You I'm all vibing. Get, yeah, you all get to see Alex's furiatingly good-looking face now. Yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> the, the mystery is revealed. Yeah, the mystery has been revealed. There's no more mystery. There's no more esotericism. It's there. He is. There he is. And now suddenly they're all disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How does it feel to be the number one main man in the spotlight? I mean, it doesn't feel any different than any other day because I always was number one. Oh my <laughs> god, dude! The he first... was number one. <laughs> Schmitty Werben Jägerman Jensen. <laughs> yeah, Alex also made a compliment or a, a comment that we look like condiments right now. Oh like, yeah, we do. Ryan is. <laughs> I'm ketchup. coming in strong with the ketchup game. I, I'm mustard, and he's mayo. <laughs> I've had too much camera time already. I'm not switching it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Whatever. You, you know, it's 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 your choice, man. Anyway, we're stoked. Uh, we have big things planned for 2023. This is one of the smaller ones, but it's something we've been talking about for a long time, and we're so freaking happy that our boy is on camera now. That's my dude. That's my dude right there, <laughs> and he's doing his mood was good. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I really was uplifted by that. That was a, that was a vibe. Yeah, yeah, mudras every day, baby. Mudras every mudras day, every y'all. Day. All right. Every day. We have a very special episode planned. Ryan, would you like to tell our lovely folks what it's about? Yes, well, thank you kindly for handing it back to me. Um, <laughs> I've, I've, lately, I've just been feeling the whole like cheesy radio host vibe. You know? Yeah, <laughs> like, experience with Ryan Bledsoe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, um, so um, just like... Lately, I've been really into, you know, studying. It's no secret. We talk about it on the show, like the whole meditation angle, mudras, more more so like Eastern mysticism. And my wife was talking to me or, or talking me up about this Ram Dass documentary. Yeah. The, you know, the 30 minute one on Netflix. It's it's not really so much a like a full fledged documentary. It's more so like an experience, you know. And she's talking me up about it. She watched it and she's like, please watch it with me. Please watch it with me. And we watched it the other night and my jaw was on the floor and I was like, dude, like <laughs> we got to do an episode about this. This is, this is epic. This is really profound, you know? So, and it's like coming from a traditional Christian upbringing, you mm-hmm. know, you, you don't really talk about gurus. You don't, right. That's yeah. not a concept that's, it, it's a very foreign concept. I would For say, sure. you know, to the majority of the West and watching this documentary just was, was so profound. It was, it was so peaceful. And I wanted to explore kind of how we found this avenue of information and like the implications of it and what it means. But ultimately what really resonated with me was one line and it was, I am loving awareness. Yeah. You know? So before we get too deep into the nitty gritty, for anybody who doesn't know, why don't you just let them know who Ram Dass is? Sure. Could you do me a favor, though? I can't, I can't remember his name. I think it's Richard Alpert. I think that's right. It's. I think it's Richard it Alpert. It might be R- Richard Alpert. It could be Alpert Richard, though. It, <laughs> I don't, it could be. It's, I don't, something, <laughs> it's something like that. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I don't um, Around the, I guess it was in the 60s, Yeah. Um, Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert. I'm pretty sure that's his name. Yeah. Um, Alex will confirm for us, but we're just going to roll with it. Confirmed. Confirmed. Hey, Confirmed right here. <laughs> Day one on camera. Coming out with a bang, bro. Hitting us with the facts. <laughs> I like it. Dude, you're my bang, bro. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> okay, hang on. What? Hang on. What? He came out with a bang. That's a, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. What's wrong with you know that? What? Let's let's breeze right past What's it. Go ahead. What's wrong with that? Yep, God, nothing. making a fuss about nothing. You're nothing. You're right. You're right. <laughs> nothing. There's nothing wrong. Alex is the bang, bro. Let's continue. <laughs> anyway, so, <laughs> you know, in the 60s, uh, Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert were like instrumental in the widespread of LSD and the movement, you know, like pretty much waking people up. Psychedelics. Yeah. Psychedelics. And when you zoom in on, you know, Richard Alpert and who he was and how he traveled to um God, i don't even know what country maybe it was india it was india yeah. yeah and studied under like a very profound guru there by the name of maharaji or neem karoli baba right and like i wanted to talk about this because it's relevant to things we've 
discussed on the show. We talked about this when Duncan Trussell was on the show. Right. That was my first introduction to Ram Dass because Duncan talks about Ram Dass all the time. You know what I mean? And so for a couple of years now, I've been hearing about Ram Dass. I've watched some stuff about Ram Dass and most of it comes from Duncan. But the, the really cool thing is like... Yeah, Richard Alpert is he, he was just this college professor. He was a psychologist, I believe. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. right. He was that's like right. a like a Harvard professor. Cuz he had the desire in him to like want to understand human emotion, human feelings and stuff like that. He just didn't have the inkling yet to go like super super deep. Right. And then he tried shrooms <laughs> and it blew his mind and wide LSD. open. Yeah. And LSD, yeah. And then this is this is actually something kind of funny. So he, he was let go from the school he was teaching at, and he actually went to prison because he was giving his students mushrooms. <laughs> he was like, he was waking his students up, you know, or whatever. And he, I mean, it's not like he was just doing it willy nilly, giving it to anybody. Yeah, it was like through research. It was, it was yeah. for the purpose of research and, and it medicinal was, benefits. Right. And it was students who explicitly said like, I really want to do it. It wasn't like he was just dosing people or whatever. Right. But when I heard that, the first thing I thought was like, if Ryan had become a psychology professor and he had the same experience, he would have done the exact same thing. I was like, yeah, that, that's literally some shit Ryan would do. I mean, pretty much. But, you know, so the reason particularly I wanted to talk about Ram Dass is because it's so fascinating. It's such a fascinating piece of history that I don't think, you know, like most people are privy to. But mm-hmm. to me, it's very important. So we have a story of a guy who's just your typical, I, I want to say he was a psychologist. Can you look that one up too? Ram Dass? Yeah. I know Timothy like Leary 90. was a psychologist yeah, and like, they were like buddies. Like they, you know, they ran together for a while. And what I think is particularly fascinating is that he's, you know, in the sixties, he's experimenting with these psychedelics and he's like, literally you fast forward to the later end of his life. And he's one of the world's foremost gurus of consciousness and enlightenment. And it's right. like, yeah, what fascinates me so much is how the psychedelics open the door for him to reach these states of enlightenment. You know, there's, there's a, what's up? So when you look up his professions in order, it's guru, teacher, author, actor, psychologist. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So there were psychology professors. And funnily enough about Timothy Leary, he went the opposite direction. And do you, do you know about that? Like what happened to him? No, I don't. <laughs> he, he just, uh, he literally just started handing out doses of acid and he became like <laughs> oh no literally, literally like a hippie with like curls in his hair and like <laughs> going to like Woodstock festivals and dosing out like thousands of college age kids and it, it became a totally different vibe yeah. but um you know I think it's really cool that he you know he came from psychedelics and then at the end of his life he pretty much realized like you don't need that the the quote that was given to him by Maharaji was like it was either acid or mushrooms or psychedelics it, psychedelics oh, in general it, 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 you know it's like it allows you to sit in the presence of Christ and Buddha mm-hmm. for a few minutes. Yeah. And he also said that, um, it's, it, it's good for beginners. Right. Yeah. Like it'll get you into that room. You'll have that feeling of being in the room with Christ and Buddha. That was Maharaji's words, mm-hmm. Christ and Buddha for a few minutes in time, a few moments in time. Yeah. But through doing the real work, the meditation, the path of, you know, enlightening consciousness will allow you to be there permanently. And yeah. it, it's really profound. I just, I don't know. And then we have the history there of, you know, having met Duncan Trussell and him coming on the show. And when he came on the show, he told us the story of Ram Dass and Neem Karoli Baba. But to me, it's not, it sounded, you know, at first you, you know, a, a typical English speaking person in the West, you hear these words and it's like, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it's foreign. Like you don't know, you don't know what you're hearing. You don't know anything about it. And, right, yeah. you know, going down the rabbit hole. So then after watching the Ram Dass documentary, which is super profound, literally, I, I highly recommend it. I think it's like probably one of my number one recommended watches now. Yeah. It's like a cool little slice of life near, near the end of Ram Dass's life where he, he's just like chilling at his house and like talking about the soul and consciousness and nature. And like, it's so beautiful. So at the end of his life, um, he has a stroke. He has like a severe stroke and they go to his, uh, he has a, a resort, yeah. you know, he has a resort where in, in Maui, Right. He has this, I'm, you know, repeating for the audience sake who hasn't seen the documentary, but he has a resort where you can go and pay and stay for like a week and do these meditation retreats. 
and the camera crew just follows him around and and you know this 80 plus year old man is just sitting there with his little prayer beads and he's just looking at the waves in maui and he's just daily meditating i'm loving awareness i'm loving awareness i'm loving awareness and he you know, eventually came to the conclusion that the stroke was the best thing that ever happened to him. I know, man. That, that, it's that profound. Was, that was one of the, the coolest things he said in that documentary is he was talking about how when he had the stroke, it forced him even deeper into his, himself. Right. And it was like the best thing that he, he literally said the stroke was grace. Yeah. And with a big old smile. And you know what I said when I saw, yeah, huge beaming smile. You know what I said to Casey when he, when he said that? I said, that's alchemy. Yeah. That's alchemy yeah. right there. Yeah. And and like I don't know. Like I, I wanted to talk about Ram Das and put that energy out there because it's it's mind blowing in the West, you know, you your your experience spiritually, typically, you know, from a muggle perspective, <laughs> is you go to church on Sunday and you have a pastor and you got, you know, you go to Sunday lunch with the pastor or whatever and that's it. And I don't know, it's different. Like and the East, them dudes are serious. For sure. You know, and they spend lifetimes or a lifetime, you know, going in and doing the mystical work to dissolve the barriers of the ego, totally just break them down and reach pure states of connection to consciousness, you know? And like, I, I feel in my opinion that Ram Dass is one of those real life people who, who really may have done that really may have been a real life living enlightened master in the flesh. I, I think so too. I, I think that's probably the case. Yeah. He talks about like the first time he ever tried mushrooms. It was this, like he did like a heroic dose. Like he didn't, right. he didn't right. dip his toes in. He, he went crazy the first time. And he was describing like the feeling of being connected with everything, the feeling of removing the identity and just being nothing like being just awareness, loving awareness, loving awareness. The, the cool thing that, the, that he said about that was like, when you hear awareness, you might think about your eyes and ears right. because that's how our physical bodies have awareness of our surroundings. But he's like, but the real awareness are all the tiny little cells that cre he, he said, what's looking at your eyes? What is what, you know, it's like, what, what is aware of your eyes? the little tiny cells and the little things that like our soul is behind our eyes, but it's aware of what we're doing all the time. Yeah. That's that like loving awareness thing. It's profound, bro. It's extremely profound. That's a, that's a beautiful way to describe the soul. Like it, it's, it's always there behind the scenes, your thoughts, your words, your actions, all of that stuff is like not actually you. You're, you're a piece of awareness. Yeah. You're a piece of consciousness. Like it's, it's it. It's the truth. You know, it's, 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 I don't know. It's like, it's mind boggling, mind boggling. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. But, he, um, you know, so where I wanted to go next from there mm -hmm. is another interesting figure that we have yet to meet, but right now live on Bledsoe said so. We're going to manifest it. Oh yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. You guys know we did this with Duncan. You saw it. We put our hands together and we said, ohm and we manifested Duncan on the show. We got a new one. So there's another gentleman who I am very, very keenly interested in having on the show. I think he's potentially one of the best fits out there alive, at least right <laughs> now, you know, and his name is Pete Holmes, Pete Holmes. And he's a comedian and, and, you know, my wife and I had been listening to his audiobook, and it's completely profound and it's relevant. So hit me with an ohm right now. Let's right, do it. Ready? Come on. Let's go. We would love to have Pete Holmes on the show. Pete Holmes. Oh. Dude, he has ohm in his name. Damn. <laughs> Pete Holmes. Pete Holmes. Come on our show. We would love to speak with you. <laughs> Home. Okay, we did it. So it's going to happen now. He's a comedian. He has a really... And I'm, I, I say this and I truly mean this. He has a unfathomably profound book called, what's it called? Comedy, Comedy Sex, Sex God. God. Yeah, it's called Comedy Sex God. And it's basically like an autobiography or a memoir. And it's, um, you know, detailing his life growing up as a traditional fundamentalist Christian struggling with all the things that, you know. Comes with that. That comes with that. Yeah. And... And then he tells a story probably about a quarter of the way through the book, you know, through his comedy career, uh, trying mushrooms for the first time. Mm -hmm, yeah. And he had his, 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 you know, his first profound experience that made him think outside of himself and it kind of, you know, got him thinking a little differently. 
And then he met Duncan Trussell. Yeah. He has whole chapters dedicated to Duncan Trussell and the stories there are, you know, insanely profound and how they end up at uh, one of Ram Dass's retreats in Maui. Yeah. And then, you know, the chapter of the book details Pete um, being one-on-one with Ram Dass at this retreat for a week and telling the stories there and like his experience meeting him and like, dude, I, did, did you listen to the majority of it or just specific? I listened to most of it. Yeah. Okay. Did you, did you catch the part when he was saying like when he was with Ram Dass and Ram Dass looked at him and smiled really big and he saw his face like not on hallucinogenics changing. He saw his face changing into his father. Well, he said, he said he was sitting there and, and he was in Ram Dass's house talking and he was looking at Ram Dass and he said, first Ram Dass's face started to turn into like younger version of Ram Dass and then like really old version of Ram Dass and then like sixties Ram Dass. And then he, he, it was changing back and forth and, and, and all these different versions of Ram Dass. And then it was like, uh, it was his father. It was, it yeah, was, he felt, he felt he eventually, I didn't listen to the chapter. My wife explained it to me so that I didn't know all those details, but mm-hmm. you know, from what she was telling me, he said his face changed into his father, but it was like all the love and support and protection of his father. Yeah. Now I believe when people reach certain psychic states, um, reality tends to warp around them. There's like a locus of synchronicities and bizarre spiritual happenings. Mm. Like, you know, my dad is an example of that. Things happen to him. And, um, you know, I can't really explain that when I think about it. My dad hasn't spent his lifetime meditating and things like that. It's, it's just things happen to him. But, you know, I guess my point is like, not to worship these people, not to like idolize these people, but I believe there's people that are well worth our time to study. Oh, no doubt. Like, like, Wim Hof. Yeah. You know, Wim yeah. Hof, like we, we are studying. I'm a big proponent of Wim Hof. I think he's, he's incredible, but he can literally like change his n- neural pathways. He can change. Like if he's dude, I saw a TikTok last night where they were injecting him with something. I, I, I couldn't even quote it, but it was literally something that within an hour and a half would induce like serious sickness, like serious. And they're asking him like, are you sure you want to do this? And he's like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And he did his meditation through it and it didn't affect him at all. Dude, he's literally superhuman. Well, here's the thing. That's what they were trying to test. They were like, is this some kind of anomaly? Is he just like physically, genetically higher than other people? So then they brought in 10 of his students, tested it on all of them. None of them got sick. Wow. None of them. And he says it on his website. You go to the Wim Hof method. If you, if you scroll through and you read like, I don't know exactly what page it's on, but you know, you find that he based his meditation techniques off of Tibetan practices. You know, again, we find ourselves right back to the mystical East and what's so special about the mystical East. Well, you know, you get into Blavatsky and really deep down occult studies in, in theosophy, theosophy and, and, and Rosicrucianism. And, and there's a real belief that, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a real belief that the wisdom of Atlantis may have initially been translate, uh, transmitted not to Egypt at first, but actually before the wisdom of Atlantis was transmitted through the sages to the mystery schools of Egypt it may have went to Kathmandu in Tibet. Oh, wow. Which is why you see such an overlap in Gnostic, Hermetic, Rosicrucian, which you would say are like Western esoteric sure, traditions yeah. Yeah. and Eastern esoteric traditions. You know, you have the, the Tao, the, the, I think it's the Tao and the Tao, the Chinese mystical practices. Um, Tibetan Buddhism and Tantra, all these practices are like literally describing and even uh, reaching the same altered states of consciousness and, and, you know, pathways to enlightenment as these Western esoteric schools. And then you have people like Blavatsky who are even telling you this, who are telling you like the, the, you know, the Tibetan masters from Kathmandu were, you know, they had the secrets and, and Blavatsky physically went, there right and studied in monasteries there and you know that's that's why i wanted to talk about ramdas is i i i believe there's something to that i mean bro you study i'm I'm really deep in in studying gnostic there, there's a there's a online freely published um gnostic course 
that was written by a man in the 60s named, Sa- he called, I don't know his real name. He called himself Samael Aun Weor. And it's like some mystical name. A lot of these people backed in, I think it's silly, but whatever. They come up with these mystical names and that's what they go by. And anyway, the information is legit as far as Gnosticism is concerned. And and they tell you right there, it's all mantras, mm-hmm. vibrational syllables, chakra syllables, um, mixed with Western esoteric practices, mixed with Aztec esoteric practices. And like, these sages are literally syncretizing all of these, uh, you know, mystery schools and, and, and to one body of knowledge that we can reach, uh, I guess you could call it like illumination or gnosis or, you know, the solar body or whatever and rainbow body as they would call it in Tibet. And I, I believe, you know, as far as public figures are concerned, Ramdas is one of those people that is, is worth people's time. You know, watch the documentaries the, the, it's, it's literal American history. Oh yeah. You know, with the psychedelic movement, he's, he's like one of the fathers of the LSD movement. It's, yeah. it's profound. And where did he end up? India. A guru. Yeah, exactly. Oh yeah. He, yeah, he became a guru. <laughs> literally one of the foremost gurus. I love in that documentary when they talk about his guru, Maharaji, right? like, Bro, it, it was just hearing the things. So they would say like, you know, you go, you have to find Maharaji in India, whatever. Lots of people would make this pilgrimage or whatever. They would show up and he's just like, just like some dude in like a robe or whatever, just like laying around in the street, like just, just chilling, doing his thing. But like people would just get near him and weep because of this overwhelming feeling of unconditional love. Yeah. This like strong, strong pulse, this like field of unconditional love. Like I'm just imagining meeting somebody like that. Yeah. And like what that would feel like. I would, I would love to meet somebody like that. You know what I mean? Like, you yeah. know, they're all passed away by now. But. Well, that's the cool thing though, is in that docu, no, 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 sorry, not in the documentary in comedy sex, God, uh, Pete was talking about how he was talking to Duncan and he was like, he was like, man, I feel like, I feel like I missed the boat, you know, Maharaji. Like, I I wish I could have met him or whatever. And Duncan tells him like, you will, you'll meet him. He's like, you are now. He lives through. Well, uh, yeah, it's the the crazy thing is. So Pete was staying with Ram Dass and he was asking him about that. Like, I can't help but feel like I might've missed the boat. Like, meeting your guru, meeting Maharaji or whatever. And then, uh, you know, Ram Dass basically told him like, you didn't miss it. And when he said that, Pete said he could literally feel like a different love, a different energy shoot through Ram Dass into Pete. And, and for a few minutes, they just sat there in silence. And then Pete just said, I thought I missed him. And Ram Dass said, you didn't. That's profound, man. The, the, the fact that someone can exude such powerful love that no matter where one of their friends or followers or whatever goes in the world, no matter where they go, they are carrying that love with them and can transmit that love. Like, that is so mind-blowing. That brings me a memory. Um, this is in the Pete Holmes book. As well as I'm 99% positive Duncan told the story when he was on our show. Oh. Um, Maharaji, the guru of Ram Das, is the man who they fed the acid to. Yeah, that's so, in the book. That's yeah, the book. but I want to I go into the details of it. So oh, yeah. before, obviously, before Ram Das was... Ram Dass, that's the name that Maharaja gave him when it, it means something like servant of God or something like yeah, that. Yeah, Ram is God. That's exactly right. right. Yeah. 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 Okay, cool. So before he was Ram Dass, he was just, you know, a psychology professor and he's studying the world and he's, he, he, he was on a personal mission from a, from a professor perspective, right. you know, like scientifically, like this, this is all in Pete Holmes book as well. Um, there's a whole chapter of it. It's, it's so, it's just so riveting, dude. And, uh, he's like going to India and all these places in, in the, in the East. And he's like, I am fascinated to see what will happen if I give these ascetic monks super high doses of LSD just to see what will happen. Yeah. And this is how he meets Maharaji (laughs) and he gives him the super high dose of LSD and literally nothing happens. Well, yeah. at, At first he's like, uh, he, he's talking to him about it and whatever. And Maharaji is like, uh, like basically tells him like, 
I'm already there. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm already there. And so Ramdas is he basically like, whatever you want to give me, give it to me. I think Ramdas started by giving him two tabs of acid, which is like, that's a, it's a fair bit. From what I hear, that's a fair bit. I've never done acid, but like from, from what I hear, that's a decent amount. And he gave it to him. And uh, actually, Duncan told this story on a different thing with an extra detail, which is that Maharaji kind of like messed with Ram Dass, yeah, And yeah. he was kind of like, oh, or whatever. <laughs> and then he was like, I'm just kidding. I, I, it's, I don't feel anything. Uh, and, insane, and so uh, Ram Dass is sitting there like, did I just fry this guy's brain? Like, did I just, oh, no, what did I do? Or whatever. It didn't affect him. So then he goes harder and gives him like four to six tabs of acid. He's like, you can give me as much as you want. Gave it to him. No effect. Keep in mind, this was in like the 60s and 70s when, when this stuff was emerging. It, there, 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 wasn't this, there wasn't this prevalent knowledge and, and, and it's not like they just had access to the Maharaji had never done this. This no. wasn't spread around the world. This was when acid was emerging around the world. You know, it was a new frontier. Mm-hmm. That's why he was doing it. And it's, that's so profound to me. Like the proof is in the pudding that there are, there, there's a potential mm-hmm. that that's, that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to say like we should idolize these people. What, right. I'm, what I'm trying to say is that they are proof that it is possible to reach altered states of consciousness through meditation introspection, love, you know, all the, all the positive things that go with it and yada, yada, yada. And it's so mind blowing to me. And then, okay, so here's what happened next. So that night, I I don't remember what night it was. Maybe this past Tuesday I watched it. It was, it was a few days ago. And then, and then she goes, I've heard of another documentary we should check out called how to change your mind. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh shoot, my, my buddy, Jason, shout out Jason. He's a very, very wonderful dear friend did, of mine. Did, did you just point to where the camera used to be? Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I pointed to where it used to I, be. I noticed that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I wasn't going to acknowledge it. But yeah. But um, shout out Jason. He's very, very dear friend yeah, of mine. Out. Uh, yep. And he <laughs> recommended this documentary to me. And anyway, so um, I was like, oh yeah, my, my friend told me about this one. And um, so right after the, the Ramdas one, um, we, by the way, it's on Netflix. If anybody, you just, both of these are right. Yes. Yeah. If you just go on Netflix and you type in Ram Dass, it's like 31 minutes worth it. Listen, the first few minutes are boring. That is totally, it, it, it's like, don't go into it expecting it to be dense with knowledge. It's not about that. It's a, it's a peaceful, serene, <laughs> meditative day in the life of Ram Dass. And it's profound. Yeah. Anyway. At its core, it's like an old dude hanging out at his house, like at its, you know what yeah. I mean? But it's, 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 it's not a documentary. Right. It's not telling you his whole life, right. but it's high on my list of recommended material to, to consume anyway. So right after that, Jenny's, my wife is like, you know, let's, let's watch how to change your mind or, or, or there's, there's a documentary my coworkers been telling me about, about psychedelics. We should check it out. And I was like, I think this is the one my friend Jason's telling me about. So we turn it on and boom, the first episode is about Ram Dass. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's about Richard Albert <laughs> right. and, and a number of things. It's like the entire history of LSD. It's, it's about the synthesis of it. And, um, it's about, uh, Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert Mm -hmm. being like the pioneers of, of the spread of, you know, essentially the psychedelic movement in the sixties and low key man. Like this is something I've never said before. Oh, sorry. But how dare you? How dare me touch your hand like yeah, that? Yeah, man, I, I wasn't ready for that. How dare me? You, you got to prepare me for your energy next time, okay? For those not now we can viewing, I just accidentally brushed upon Nick's hand, and now we're going to lock fingers, engage. And guess... <laughs> <laughs> engage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It must anyway, be nice so, to touch each other over shut there. Shut up, dude. You're on camera now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you choose to be over there on the other side of the lights. Yeah. How about that? Um, in, I look in, good in, over here, yeah, too. Yeah, in space, with sp- literal space behind you. So shoot, where was I before I touched you? So <laughs> you were watching the documentary. Surely, <laughs> that doesn't sound right. Non consensual. Anyway, um, you, you know one thing. Did you remember where you were going? No, I was just I was just I, riffing I, about. I have one thing to say that's really you know if you take this a step further and you think about the fact that okay this this guru Maharaji who people perceive to be enlightened is given one of the most powerful psychedelics on the planet. One of the, Mm -hmm. you know, and it it does nothing. Take it one step further, pull that thread. What does that tell you? 
meditation and getting to that place of like meeting your higher self, becoming your higher self, becoming like that loving awareness thing is the same, is doing the same thing psychedelics are doing to you. Because if you, yeah. you know what I'm saying? But it just takes more work. It takes more pulling and, you know, it's, it's a time thing. Well, but, exactly. Yeah. Psychedelics, but, like, like Maharaji said, it, you get a few minutes, you're, you're in right. the room for a few minutes, but yeah. like when, when these monks and these enlightened people train their entire lives to have that awareness and that enlightenment, they're living in it. They're, I remember what I was going to say now. Oh, go for it. So this is something I've never said publicly because th- there's a lot of things that my dad has told me that it's like, how do you even deal with this? But he, he told me that the entities communicated to him that the dark plan for humanity really began to unfold in the late 60s or 1970 in that era. And he th- they didn't give him any details. They just said the dark plan for humanity began to unfold. And what what I've been contemplating for the last few years is does that have to do with the hippie movement and the spread of psychedelics? And I honestly believe this is just my own personal theory. I haven't read this or nobody's told me this. This is just me riffing, you know? And it's like, I honestly believe that because of the spread of these substances, which by the way, were literally being regularly consumed in the far ancient past. Mm -hmm. It's just in the 1940s, you know, um, I think his name is Albert Hoffman, the Bicycle Day. I, I think that's his name. Can you yeah, confirm? Yeah, that sounds right. I What's confirm. Bicycle Day? Okay. You don't know Bicycle Day? Okay. No, okay. 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 So uh, in, in the 1940s, a Swiss chemist, he was working for a pharmaceutical company and they were trying to develop some sort of medicine or, or, or chemical from ergot root. Okay. What is ergot root? That's what acid comes from. Is it? Yeah. Remember the, the ancient and the, and the mysteries of Eliseus dude in, in ancient Greece, they were writing about taking this magical potion, po- uh, potion. I was going to say potion, potion, <laughs> potion from Kaikion. <laughs> uh, they were taking this magical potion called Kaikion when they would go to the oracles of Delphi to receive hallucinogenic and, 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 and they listed the ingredients in the ancient past and it was ergot root. It was, wow. it's, they were taking acid. Wow. They were taking the, the natural form of acid. And anyway, so in the 1940s, Swiss chemist, he was literally extracting ergot root and he was sitting on large quantities of LSD without having any clue of what it was doing because I think the company like shut down production or they decided it wasn't, you know, what they were looking for or something. I, it's in the documentary, how to change your mind. I can't fully recall the details, but long story short, one day he goes back to the compound and he's trying to do some like experiment with it. And the poor fella has never heard of acid in his life. No one had, you know, and some of the chemical leaked and touched his fingers and he starts tripping in his lab and he's like, <gasps> like Oh so, my God. Wait, so, I'm familiar. I'm no, vaguely familiar. He didn't start tripping in his lab. That's how you get to bicycle day. So he's packing up his, um, packing up his lab to go home and he rides his bike home. That's not what the documentary said. On the bicycle, he starts to trip. What? That's, that's. The documentary said it touched his fingers. He starts having visuals and then he's like, I want to take more. And then a few days later, or it could have been the same day. I don't recall. He takes more. And then he, like you said, he calls his assistant. He's like, "I I think I need help getting home, you know, can you help me on bicycle? And when he's on his bicycle riding home, he, he's just tripping balls. Oh, and so bicycle day is so it's April 19th, day. the day before 420. Let's go. It's the day acid was so discovered. It's, it's the day you're supposed to do acid then, I guess. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and don't get it twisted. Like I've never done acid. I'm not sitting here recommending acid to people. I'm, what I'm doing is I'm pondering. Like, is, oh, no, is, yeah, is, I, is it a valuable tool? Yeah, no, I haven't done it either. I don't know that I ever will. We'll see. We'll see what, you know, time brings. I like mushrooms, but you know, yeah, it, it, it's got to be an important tool if people like Ram Dass and, and Terrence McKenna and, you know, people, people use this stuff for profound, you know, spiritual things. So, uh, yeah, I don't have any problem believing that. You know what I'm curious about? Does your dad know anything about like Ram Dass or have you shown him? No. Any? I would love. Dad doesn't sit here and just talk about this stuff like this. 
Right. He, 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 I mean, he, don't get me wrong. Like, I'm not saying dad, <laughs> that dad is an incredibly deep thinker and incredibly analytical, but, but this is not his focus. Sure. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like he's, he's interested in other things. Like he's really interested in like, you know, prophecy from, from different religion. He just has a different interest, you know, different angle. And I, I guarantee you he's never even heard of Ram Dass, you know, but um, well, it would be cool to, to show him like you should show him and yeah. see if he digs it, you know, just show him the Netflix thing and whatever. See if he likes it. That's a good idea. Yeah. I didn't consider you know, that. you know, what else I'd really like to to ask you, you you mentioned earlier that you like we were talking before the episode, you have been like searching for a, a mantra that you resonate with for a really, really long for time. For almost two years. Yeah, and, and you feel like, you know, in the documentary Ramdas says his mantra is I am loving awareness. I I wanna know why that one resonated with you so much. Okay. Um and, and like, what does it mean to you? Yeah, that's, I didn't expect to be asked that, but that's a good question. So, okay. So it's a broad number of reasons, you know, obviously our words are very powerful. Sure. You know, when you talk about the higher self and, and, and the nature of consciousness and where we come from in the first place, you know, there's one original light. There is one original spark from which all living things, material or non-material, uh, come from. It's the source of all life. It's, it's, you know, it's what we would conceive of God or the macrocosm, you know, it's, it's, it's the, it's the creative and expressive force that binds together all reality and flows through it like the force, you know, and you understand that when you incarnate in this human experience, you are never truly separated from that original piece of yourself that sprang forth from the, you know, original light. We have to understand like time is not relevant or, or it is relevant. It's not linear. Mm-hmm. It, 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 we, we come here to experience the illusion of time and the illusion of separation from our higher selves. But at some point, either aeons ago or aeons in the future, or wherever outside of this little bubble of time that we're experiencing, each one of us individual souls has a spark that sprang forth from that original light. You could say it was the big bang and we're all different stars spreading through the cosmos. And we come to this realm to experience how to, you know, achieve unity as it is in the macrocosm. You could think about it like that. I don't know this realm is about finding love and unity. Mm -hmm. I see this realm as like the heart chakra of some transcendental cosmic mind or entity you know we come here and it's about finding love and ironically everything is green in nature for the most part yeah, yeah. you know the the sunlight the the there's nasa studies that show that the the green light from the sun is the strongest is, is not only the strongest but it encodes life and all plant and animals and nature and etc really deep conversation but um anyway so you understand that we are never truly separated from our higher self and our words whether we're conscious of it or not are extremely powerful it's like You know, imagine being like lesser gods, not remembering who we are, walking around a reality with other lesser gods, speaking blessings or curses on other beings, as well as on yourself. It's Mm -hmm. like, truly our experience is manifested from our thoughts and our feelings and our words. And I guess what I'm getting at is it's very important what you speak over yourself, that it's specific, it's precise, it's accurate, it resonates with you, and it invokes the emotions in you that rewrite your brain to believe I don't know exactly I don't know like the right positive message or whatever it is you're looking for and and I've thought about it like I've I've thought about like what affirmation clicks with me I talk about affirmations but I have been slack on practicing them because I, I I'm really serious like I'm happy healthy and wealthy I'm happy healthy and wealthy cool that's great but that's not enough for me mm. you know or I am whatever popular affirmations are. I'm wise. I'm abundant. I'm receiving blessings. It's like, I say those things and it just didn't feel meaningful to me. It felt forced. It felt fake. It felt, yeah. it felt shallow. I don't, I don't know, but there's, there's something about, I am loving awareness that is like, if I could conceive of identifying with the highest version of reality, it would be pure unadulterated love. You know, when we speak in metaphysical terms, love is the force that binds and brings energies together and makes them one. And fear is the force that, you know, retracts and repels energy. And that's why, you know, when in the human life, you, you, 
if you're angry at somebody, if you're hateful or if you curse them or you attack them, it's all this fear energy that what does it do? Ultimately it pushes you away. You know? Yeah. One of the, one of the things that Ram Dass said on that little, uh, documentary was, um, you know, when you feel emotions like anger or things that you think you shouldn't be feeling because you're trying to be peaceful or whatever, he's like, so what do you do? He, he, you know, he asked like, so what do you do? Do you give into it? Do you ignore it? And he's like, no, you don't do either of those things. You love it. You, you literally fight those feelings with love. You love your anger. You love, and you know, you, you recognize it. You like, cover it and enshroud it in love and then it'll just melt away yeah that's like magic exactly it's word magic yeah and i believe i don't know just i am loving awareness i there's an energy to that term that i believe if uttered repetitively day in and day out encompasses every single thing that an incarnate entity in this realm needs to survive and to thrive. You know, think about it. Whether you're mad at another person or you're upset at another person, you know, reminding yourself to be loving towards them. It's, it's always the answer, peace, compassion, love. It's always the answer. If you're judgment, judgmental of yourself, if you're harmful to yourself, hateful to yourself, I'm loving awareness. Anytime you feel those feelings, I don't know. It's just something about it resonated with me deeply. I did. I didn't really put it into words. It just makes sense to me. It, yeah. ma- it makes sense to me that, that, that it, that that's what I want to identify with. Yeah. I don't want to just identify with being happy, healthy, and wealthy. I don't want to identify with, with being abundant. I, I don't want to identify with, with being strong or this or that. I, I want to identify with what truly matters and it's, it's Love. loving awareness. And you know, if I'm loving awareness to myself, it's, it's like, I don't know, maybe I sound crazy here, but. To me, you can't go wrong. You just, you just can't go wrong. Adopting loving awareness towards yourself and to others and to all beings. Yeah. You know, like the, the way that I kind of took the, I am loving awareness thing is he, he talks about how like all of us behind our personalities and what we think is us, our egos behind those things is the real us, the soul the awareness, you know, the, as the, Pete Holmes called it, the isness. I think he said thisness. It, well, he called it a few things, but thisness, isness. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's I like, just am. You I is, just am. I, you, you just are. You just are. And what does that even mean? Pull that one, one little thread closer. If you had to really compress and condense what it is to be something, you first of all have to be aware. You have to be in some way or another aware. And so the way that I see it is like the soul behind our eyes is always aware. Always. It's, it's our higher self. It's aware of you. It's aware of you. It's aware of everything and everyone around me. And it's also aware that you and what I know right now as you is not really you. My awareness knows that the same awareness is behind your eyes. Right. And the right. key is realizing that and then loving that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like if we can identify with our real true selves underneath the skin and flesh and whatever, that's our awareness. And so now you just got to make it beam with love, make it completely beam with love. When I heard that, that about Maharaji and how people would just get around him and just feel overwhelmed by love i was like that's all i've ever wanted to be in life is somebody who when they're around when somebody's around me i want them to feel loved like so so unconditionally loved like yeah so so loving awareness to me is like being aware of love it's being aware of true love which is it's underneath everything that we think's real yeah. I also feel like that encompasses being aware of all the negative aspects in ourselves and others, but loving them regardless. Absol- absolutely. You know, it, it, to me, yes. to me being pure loving awareness means having no judgment. Yeah. It's looking around your personality. It's looking around behind your ego and saying like, none of that shit matters, man. I know at the core 
you're just loving awareness just like me. So I'm going to look right past all the the bullshit that this realm is trying to distract me with. And I'm going to just love you in the core because like, that's you. That's really you. And like, it sounds all great. It sounds all fancy and beautiful, but like, it's hard. You know, we are literally, and we're going to talk about this a lot more in the next episode. That's, this was kind of setting the stage for that one too. But you know, we are literally born incarnate into this realm with ego barriers placed on our mind. And it's like, good luck, figure it out, tear down those barriers, you know? And like 99% of the people I would say, hopefully less, um, are not aware of their awareness because of the ego. I, when I think of the ego, I think of like, I think of like walls around your true self Mm. that are these mental constructs and they kind of like guide how you perceive your external reality and mm-hmm. you'll only perceive it from the place of truth and love when those walls begin to tear down. For sure. Uh, another one of the thing, the really cool things that Pete Holmes said was like when he was a Christian and when he was even starting to study some other religions, the idea of the soul always freaked him out yeah. because it felt separate. It felt like okay, so I'm me now, and then when I die, I'm going to become a soul. And even just even just phrasing it that way is making it an external thing. Right. It's making it something that you are not right now. But the truth is, you are a soul right now. You are only a soul right now. Yeah, you're piloting a body. You're, you're literally like Evangelion, like you're, you're li- an Evangelion, pi- an evil pilot. Like yeah. this stuff is just fun and games. The real stuff is underneath and you don't even like, the, the, the path to enlightenment is shaking hands with that part of you. The real part of you yeah. is realizing like, oh, I thought, I thought this was me, but this is not. That, that I think that's the only reason we are even here to begin with. I think that's the only reason anything exists is because we talk about all the time, like the whole Lord of the Rings allegory with like Iluvatar creating the universe. Why was the universe created? Why couldn't everything just be good the way it is, whatever? It's because we wouldn't know how to appreciate it unless we lived without it. So we come here to experience the separation the, from yeah, it. Yeah, the illusion of being separated. It, it, the illusion, But we're exactly. never truly separated. Never. But, but it feels that way because yeah. of those walls that you were, yeah. those ego walls. We're separated from everything. We believe we're separate from God. We believe we're separate from the devil. We're yeah. not. Right. Because what's the truth about that? It's the egos in our mind. Yeah. You know? It's on the shoulder, the angel yeah. and demon. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're not separate from anything. We're not separate from good. We're not separate from evil. All of these inherent qualities and traits of the macrocosm or the universe are within each and every one of us, you know? And, and we come here and we experience this illusion of separation and it's just profound, man. Like watching things like Ram Dass and all this, it just, it gets me thinking. Back to what I was saying earlier, I, I, I do believe that in the 60s when, when these chemicals, which previously have been found in nature, that's why I brought up the ergot root, you know, like acid, LSD, technically is synthesized from air, uh, ergot root. Is and, that, Alex, is that what um, ayahuasca is made out of? I, I'm so ignorant. No, I'm pretty sure the plant is no. ayahuasca, right? Oh, see, uh, it's I a different know. kind of root, but let me, let me pull it up for you. Okay. Yeah. I, I was just curious if any other psychedelics are made with ergot or is it ergot or ergo? Ergot. Uh, ergo. Well, I don't know. I think it's called ergot. Okay. It's yeah. I'm just curious. E-R-G-O-T. Well, sorry. Go ahead. But um, yeah. So LSD was synthesized from ergot and around the same time as when mushrooms are found and, um, you know, discovered mm-hmm. in the West and th- this episode two of that documentary, how to change your mind is about mushrooms also profound mm-hmm. and, and the way they were discovered. And it's like, there was this brief period at about mid century America, or, you know, 1900s where all of a sudden they're discovering these psychedelic compounds. And we started to have these catapults in, in, in the, the changing of human consciousness. And like, this was a major reason why the, the CIA and the military got involved with MK ultra. And also they had, dude, this is literal real history, dude. The CIA started leaking, uh, propaganda campaigns on the streets about LSD oh, and about yeah. how it'll basically like fuck your kids up. Well, they did the same thing with weed reefer madness. Yeah. While simultaneously putting it in people's water supply. Ugh. And then they put out, you know, 
video infomercial type things about how acid is evil and it'll make you born uh, or it'll make you like be sterile and have miscarriages and it'll make you like mutated and it'll change you forever and people will take it and they'll want to fly and they'll jump off buildings and kill themselves. <laughs> All that negative stuff was put out by Big Pharma and the CIA. Is this Alex Conspiracy Corner? Is that is that what's going on right now? Yes. <laughs> you're you're just like sending Ryan like telepathically sending Ryan the things to say. <laughs> He's like beep, 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 yeah. beep, beep. <laughs> bro. I got so many buttons over here. It's getting confusing. No, bro. you're doing great, bro. Look you're at you. Great. You look amazing. Yeah, that's all that matters, right? Thank you, brother. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'll give Alex a break out there because we just bought a brand new camera, and then we bought a brand new switchboard. And today's day one of running three cameras. So y'all give him a break if he messes up the mixes. <laughs> I, I have messed up already. It's all I, good. They, if you're watching, you know, but it's all good. because It's all good. We're just hanging out. Yeah, by the way, fun. For, for all the uh, people listening and not watching, you got to come over to YouTube if you want to see Alex's face. I'm, trust me, you won't be disappointed. Yeah, this, this is... This is <laughs> but uh, Nick, I don't like YouTube because of all the ads. What can I do about that? Oh, well, you could subscribe to our Patreon. Word. I'll have to check it are out. You, <laughs> <laughs> are you not subscribed to our Patreon, Alex? Me? Bledsoe said so, or patreon.com slash Bledsoe said I so? should subscribe. I mean, I'm in the Discord, but like, I don't, <laughs> I don't know how I got there. I just woke up one day and I was in the Discord. <laughs> yeah. So. Damn, man. <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> whoop, whoop, whoop. Did you turn into a robot? Siren. No, the radio, the soundboard. Is that oh, plug? Someday plug we'll have alert? a soundboard, dude, and we'll have some fun with it. Do you remember more what? buttons? Yeah, mo even more buttons, yes. But we'll be con in control of the soundboard. It'll be right here. Oh, Lord. <laughs> uh, do, do you remember the name of the monkey god? Hanuman. Hanuman. Yeah. Dude, the thing that he said about... So in that documentary, Ram Dass, he described that he has like he has like little statues all around his, um, his like house and his land and whatever. And uh, the statues are there because... There are there are like archetypal energies or spirits or whatever you want to call them that literally like hang out around that area. Like he can actually identify and feel those those energies. And so he has this little shrine for Hanuman. Yeah. And one of the things oh, I, I want to make sure I get it right. He said um, he said he went into his garden and he as he often does to communicate with Hanuman. And he, he was asking him, you know, just who like, are you? who are you? And Hanuman said, uh, when I don't know who I am, I serve you. When I know who I am, I am you. I, I, I paused the documentary and like sat there in thought for a minute, just like reflecting on philosophically what that means. And like, that's what, that is probably the thing that hit me the most out of the documentary was that specific statement. It is like, it, 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 it so eloquently describes how I really feel about things, which is like, when you're not feeling like yourself, you should serve yourself. You, you should be that, that energy for yourself. And then when everything's all good, you realize we're all one. We're all the same thing. Like I identified a lot with that statement. I thought that was so cool. I like that. Yeah, I, I really... So now I want to do a bunch of research about Hanuman. Is that, That's like a Hindu god? I think it was... Um, I, I, I don't... Maybe. Yeah, or Chinese remember. or... I don't remember I don't specifically, know. but uh, it, it was so, so, so cool. Did you find anything about the ergo, ergot? It is not the same root. Okay, as ayahuasca. So yeah. is ayahuasca closer to acid or, or DMT? Do DMT no, comes, I, yeah go ahead Ryan DMT and ayahuasca are virtually the same like DMT is in yeah. ayahuasca okay okay correct yeah and so DMT is like the rocket ship mm -hmm. and ayahuasca is like the little stroll down the river oh so so but ayahuasca is hours not to say it's not serious but but ayahuasca is like a 12 14 hour process oh dmt is like uh 15 eight, minutes 15 minutes yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's 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 extracted differently but it's the same it's the same thing 
you know, yeah, D- DMT is the molecule. Yeah. Ayahuasca is, is like one of the plants that contains the molecule. I think that's how it goes, but they're hand in hand. They're the same. They also have those toads like out in the desert that secrete yeah. a, a type of DMT uh-huh. and people lick them and drip, dude. That's crazy. There's, there's videos on YouTube of like people doing that with shamans and whatever. And they literally lick a toad and apparently that's the strongest form of DMT there is. Wow. It's like called like three DMT or I'm probably completely missing. There's a five it. MEO DMT. That might be but it. I, you know, that, that might be it. I've heard that's insane. But anyway, you know, to wrap up the acid thing, I, I do believe that with the spread of these substances or, or the emergence of these substances, particularly in the sixties and then the demonization of them. And, you know, there was evidence that in through the 1940s and fifties, dude, there were tens of thousands of, Dozens of thousands of success reports from like professors and clinical psychologists implementing LSD into their treatment with patients for addiction, PTSD, depression, anxiety, tens of thousands of reports of success in the (laughs) forties that was scrubbed from history. It's obviously you know, still there. It's still recorded history. And then, you know, the demonization came and then what Mm -hmm. happened in 1969? War on Charles. Well, that was in 70. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Cause Charles Manson and his acid taking hippie cult started killing people, you know? And obviously, you know, we don't believe that was organic. Obviously that was put out as as a, I I believe it's not obvious, but I believe it was a false flag. Yeah. I mean, you said it yourself, like people from the forties to the sixties are waking up with all these psychedelics and stuff. And like, that's against their agenda. The number, you know, the 1%, it's against their agenda. So they're like, we got to find a way to shut this down. And then, yeah, they use Charles Manson. And then the next year you got Nixon war on drugs, war on drugs. Psychedelics were deemed uh, class one or whatever the terminology is like federal uh, prohibited substances. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they completely just used Charles Manson as like the demon, as like the, right. the face of it and, and whatever. And there's books about it that talk about what they did to him and, and how they manipulated him and how they demonized him. And obviously he's a fucked up dude. Like obviously yeah, for sure. it, it, he wasn't just, they didn't just like make him evil. He was already like, he had some dark shit, a lot of dark shit going on, but they, they kind of like hitched to his wagon and they were like, we can use this bro. There's footage in that documentary, how to change your mind of like the military, even even, not even just MK ultra, but like the military was giving it to their soldiers. And there's literally in the footage, the soldiers are all just giggling. Yeah, dude. Remember They're the, just happy. Yeah, remember the opening scene of Pineapple Express? Yeah. Where Bill Hader is like smoking the thing and they're like, how's it going or whatever? And he's like, I feel like a, a stack of flapjacks. And he starts like doing a little jazz like. Tss, tss, tss. Yeah. He's just like in pure bliss. Happy, open minded. He's, like, yeah, he's like, I creative. love you guys. He's, he's just being happy. And they're like, it's illegal. They're like, they're like, write it up. It's <laughs> shut illegal. it down. Yeah, shut it down. He's insane. Classified. It's like, bruh. They saw it's like making him happy and he's all loving everybody around him. And they're like, nope, can't have this. So my conclusion with that is I, I, I believe it's possible that in the 60s, we almost reached an age of Aquarius level of enlightenment, but it was stopped. It was forcefully stopped by the powers to be and it altered our timeline. Mm. You know, we entered a totally new era in 1970. Yeah. You know, and then the eighties came around and then you got the CIA pushing crack cocaine into all of these communities, you know, the world drugs and that, and then people are going to prison for life for having a few ounces of weed. And you know, it's like, we're, we're in a pretty fucked up place right now. For sure. For sure. And it's like, other than, other than the Charles Manson stuff, it's like they, they create these scenarios to make this stuff seem scary. Yeah. And we, we do maintain the idea that it's not for everybody and you got to be super careful with this stuff. We're always very, yeah. very upfront about that. It's not something you can play with willy nilly. But ultimately, if you look at the numbers, you look at the studies, like overwhelmingly positive results, overwhelmingly. Yeah. There are exceptions, but the fact that, it, that drugs like weed, psilocybin, DMT, acid, have been so demonized when they have such profound positive effects. It just, it's a red flag. It's a huge red flag. That's just saying like, this is by design. 
they did this on purpose. Yeah. They want to keep us down. They want they to keep us down. They want to keep us closed minded. They want to keep us sick mm-hmm. and dependent on their synthetic chemicals that don't heal us. Because a patient cured is what, Ryan? A patient lost. A cus- Money lost. A customer lost. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Yeah. Also, customer I want lost. New York Times National Park Service asked visitors to please stop licking toads. <laughs> and, and and i want to be clear here we're not we're not saying don't take your antidepressants yeah no i'm not know. i'm not saying of course that. i just I'm wanted to be that. i just wanted to be clear about it because like you know there, there definitely are some pharmaceuticals that can help you a lot i think that it's probably it sh- in most cases shouldn't be a permanent solution at least that's my opinion you know it, that that's just me i think that for me Antidepressants help me a lot in the moment, but while I am relying on them, I'm working on meditating, becoming, you know, one with my higher self and doing things that will allow me to handle those things on my own. Yeah, they ultimately, they just don't heal you, you know? Right. It's like a Band-Aid. It's like a Band-Aid. It's like as long as you... You find you find the medicine that works for you and you take it regularly, it'll patch it'll patch things up. But, you know, in, in most cases, I think ultimately you shouldn't strive to stay on it forever. But, you know, as long as you need to do it, it is good and it does help a lot. Um, but just, yeah, personally, I would love to be at a place one day where I can say, like, I am spiritually whole enough. I am, I am resolved enough in myself to be able to let that go and be okay. Yeah. It's just kind of like the monks with like, or, or people who take psychedelics to feel that oneness and whatever. And then, but their eventual goal is to be able to feel that all the time, just by meditating, just by thinking, just, you know, the thing, it's the same thing. It's like, eventually we'll, we want to be there on our own, but in the meantime, it's, it's fine to use, to use some band-aids, you know, whatever. It, like he said, it's like psychedelics are great for beginners. Right. It opens the door. It opens the door to uh, perceive at least close to the true nature of consciousness, what it is, what it means, how it operates. I mean, dude, and and this documentary, they were showing people back in the 40s and 50s on film and like just regular ordinary people signing up for trials, this mystery chemical. They're trying to see what it'll do. And like, there was this woman who's taking it and and they're like, what do you see? What do you describe? And she's like reaching out and she's like, I can, I can see the molecules in the air. Whoa. I can see the colors. Everything is connected. And like these people started waking up and then you have people like Ram Dass. Everything's one. Everything's connected. He's becoming a guru and he's coming off acid and you know, he's, he's enlightened, enlightened, enlightened and it's spreading around. And, I, I, I believe that, uh, you know, they do open a doorway Mm -hmm. to a higher level of perception, but the key is not to rely on that. I think, I think it's a helpful tool. I think, I think these things can, can serve tremendously, you know, positive rewards and benefits to us, but ultimately, you know, we got to rewrite our programming. Mm. We, we have to rewrite our cognitive programming. We have to rewrite our fundamental model and how we view reality. And that's why I am loving awareness resonated with me so much because I'm very peculiar about the things that I speak over myself or, or over others. Mm. And, you know, from a psychological perspective, there are off the top of my head, there are two ways to rewrite the subconscious mind. Way number one, being in a state of hypnosis. Mm. Way number two, continually repeating the same suggestions or phrases. What do we call that? Affirmations. So it's like, that's why I've been hesitant to repeat certain affirmations that didn't vibe with me. Cause it's like, do I really want to write this programming into my brain? Sure. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. To where I literally believe and operate this way on a subconscious level. So yeah. that's my thing to, to go back to your, to your, to your question about the I'm loving awareness from like, what was that? Like an hour ago? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like, that's what I want to write my brain to believe. That's, that's to me, that covers everything. Yeah. Loving awareness covers everything. It it's, covers compassion towards your neighbor, compassion towards yourself, understanding, you know, loving awareness is eternal and that, it's God. Yeah. And that like, we are not our bodies and we are just loving awareness. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, I honestly, I, I fell in love with that mantra too. It's beautiful. It's so, it, it's so concise and it covers, it covers everything. It covers everything important. It's like identifying with and connecting to God. Yeah, exactly. You know? love. But it's not saying I'm God. You know, that's like delusional, but. Right. But it is saying I am loving awareness and God is loving awareness. Right. That's what it's saying. Yeah. It's like, you know, and so it, it's in a way it's like, you know, we are God because we are loving awareness and that is God. Yeah. Fucking beautiful, dude. It's so inspiring. Like I, I, I could, I could listen to Ram Dass talk forever. I could watch endless documentaries about Ram Dass. He's, he's just like a really cool, profound hippie dude. Like, he, yeah, he's just really cool. I, I like him a lot. It's epic, dude. Yeah, Where and I love hearing Duncan talk about Ram Dass too. So well, yeah. I guess we uh, can uh, ring out another ohm. Oh yeah, absolutely. Let's do an ohm to bring it out. Alex, put yourself on the camera right now and do it with us. <laughs> Ready? Wait, wait, no, that's you. All right. Oh, bye, guys. <laughs> Say bye, guys, Alex. Bye, guys, He's Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. If you want to see more, check out our other videos. And before you go, don't forget to subscribe. See you next week. Peace. Peace.